has been life on Earth for over two billion years, and man himself has existed here for at least a million. Yet it is no more than 15 years since life has emerged out of our atmosphere into outer space. Historians a million years hence may well regard the middle of this century as the turning point of earthly life and of our own species. America's space program today stands on its own feet, an heroic manifestation of the vital evolutionary progress of man toward a higher and better life. It is justified by its success to date, by its promise of continuing success in the future, and in the enlargement of human knowledge of the universal environment in which our spaceship Earth travels. Its accomplishments to date are marvelous, bordering on the incredible. From a humble, sputtering beginning, man has progressed to today's mighty Saturn V rocket. Many years ago, a figure quite familiar to most of us today came upon the scene. His name, Buck Rogers. The younger generation of four decades ago were engrossed with his escapades in the future. So, that younger generation grew up, and using the example that Buck had shown them, designed and built their way into the future. For instance, he predicted men would fly around with little jets strapped to their backs. Forty years later, we are doing just that. In 1932, Buck predicted atomic energy and its use for producing electrical energy for mankind. Today, we have it. In 1936, Buck and Wilma explored the moon, and in the dim light, they thought they saw something move. Since July 20th, 1969, that movement could have been American astronauts. Five centuries ahead of Buck's prediction. In 1903, man, for the first time, using generated power, flew away from his planet. Orville Wright flew about 20 feet high, and he traveled about 200 feet before returning to Earth. His journey lasted 12 seconds. Today, 70 years later, we have reached the planets. Who is to say how soon before man reaches the stars? Some believe that this is man's destiny, his ultimate purpose. Until that day arrives, he will remain restless, always searching, exploring, expanding against the unknown, for such is his nature. Many say that this should not be, that the money spent on space should be spent right here on Earth. They are quite honestly wrong. But other great people have been wrong too. Daniel Webster once said, it is a waste of taxpayers' money to explore west of the Adirondacks. Later on, we will show you just how wrong the critics of the space program are. But what about today? Where are we in space exploration? What does the immediate future hold? The point of this nostalgic look at Buck Rogers was to show you just how much we have condensed the technology of the future into the past 30 to 40 years. Hopefully, that brief journey into the past will prepare all of us to accept the fact that the next 30 to 40 years will witness far greater projections into future technology and space accomplishment. What has space exploration and the vast wealth invested in it brought to the average man and woman? We shall see. You are all aware of the amazingly successful Apollo program a program that has been called the greatest technological achievement in the history of mankind. Yet there are people, important people, that scoff at Apollo as a waste of good money. Until Apollo, we honestly had little background for space. We had to produce an almost superhuman effort to develop materials and technology that we knew little about. So we entered a period that is best termed the age of space exploration. Not only exploring space, but also the technologies of the space industry itself. With the Apollo Lunar Landing Program completing its task in December 1972, we are at last ready to enter the golden age, the age of space exploitation. If you look up that word in the dictionary, you will find it means to make use of. That's where we stand now, ready to use the knowledge that we have gained in space to even a greater degree than the past decade for the benefit of all mankind. 
The first step is the program called Skylab. We have modified the third stage of the Apollo 5 launch vehicle and transformed it into an orbiting laboratory. A laboratory in which men perform experiments, all aimed at benefiting the Earth and those on it. Three separate man crews staying up as long as 56 days will spend most of their time studying ways to benefit Earth. The next major program will be the Apollo Soyuz test project, ASTP which will find an Apollo spacecraft docking with a Soviet Soyuz. Crews will be bilingual and actually will spend time in each other's spacecraft. There are many important tasks to be accomplished here, but none as important as bringing together two former antagonists for a venture in peace. After this program, we will be ready for man's first real step toward the stars. It is hard to exaggerate the importance of the space shuttle to man's future in space, and for that matter, perhaps his survival on this planet. For this is the vehicle man will use to jump a thousand years into the future. Scholars someday may look back upon the first flight of the space shuttle as the beginning of true space travel. So what is the space shuttle, and what does it mean to our nation and the people of the world? The Space Shuttle, which will be operational during the 1980s and 90s, is a reusable vehicle. Its orbiter might best be described as a space truck. Really, that's its main purpose, to transport cargo or personnel from Earth to space. With it, we will have ended the building probably forever of huge one-use booster rockets. For with the shuttle, many projects will be assembled in space. A key feature of this space truck is its enormous cargo bay. Remember that the shuttle is not small. In fact, it is far larger than any spacecraft ever built. The Apollo command module is tiny beside it. The cargo bay is 60 feet long with a 15-foot diameter. This compares in size to the passenger compartment of a 747. It is in this compartment, or cargo bay, that the space truck will carry its large payloads into space. The greatest expenses of the space program have been the launch costs and expendable spacecraft. With the shuttle, however, there will be a tremendous reduction in the cost of America's space program. The rough estimate is that the cost of launching each pound of space cargo will be reduced about 90%, from $1,000 to $100 per pound. In order to give you a better understanding of how the shuttle works, let's follow a projected launch and performance of this craft that holds the key to man's venture into space. Actually, the shuttle orbiter is a space airplane which is capable of more than 100 flights to space and back. It will be launched in a vertical position as a rocket. The orbiter has three main engines. Each of these develop 470,000 pounds of thrust. Fuel, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen for the orbiter engines will be carried under the belly of the shuttle orbiter. Strapped to the external tank are two recoverable solid rocket motors which will assist in boosting the shuttle from the launch pad. These solid propellant motors generate four million pounds of thrust each. After liftoff at about 23 miles, the two solid rocket motors will have used all of their propellant and will be jettisoned. Then they will be brought back to a pre-selected landing site by parachute. The shuttle orbiter, meanwhile, continues on its own power to climb to approximately 125 miles, where the giant belly tank is jettisoned. The orbiter then stays in Earth orbit for a nominal period of seven days, performing a multitude of tasks. The primary purpose of the shuttle will be to place satellites in orbit. Using the huge cargo bay, which is capable of handling even the largest projected satellites, we will carry them up to orbital altitude without the use of those expensive boosters. The United States is at least a decade ahead of the rest of the world with the shuttle, and we are already having many serious inquiries from other nations that wish us to launch their satellites for them. Eventually, these launchings could produce a profit bonanza for the United States. 
Most satellites today have a fairly short life expectancy. Think of the huge savings the shuttle will produce. For instead of this vast waste, the shuttle can bring repair crews to them or bring them back to Earth for extensive overhauling. Space age technology is moving so fast that today's best part may be tomorrow's antique. Shuttle crews can replace outdated parts with modern up-to-date new ones and install new systems, thus prolonging their usefulness to infinity. Many satellites require a synchronous orbit to stay over the same part of the Earth. That means that they must go up to at least 22,300 miles. Using the orbiter cargo bay as a launching platform at several hundred miles up, reduces the tremendous propulsion power needed to get them into deep orbit and dramatically reduces the cost. The payloads that can be used with a shuttle are limited only by size, weight, and man's creative imagination. The day is not far away when fully equipped laboratories manned by leading scientists and engineers are placed into orbit. Such research that they conduct could revolutionize medical and manufacturing techniques. Keep in mind that these people, including women, will be able to work in a comfortable shirt sleeve atmosphere. Virtually anyone will be able to go into space. Later versions of the shuttle could be space liners that will travel from Earth to hotels, factories, or even cities in outer space. Another very important aspect of the shuttle is that it can be easily outfitted as a short-duration space station. The orbiter could be equipped to stay in space for 30 days, constantly monitoring the entire surface of the Earth for such programs as air, water, and ground pollution monitoring. Eventually, probably during the next 20 years, we will build a true space station. The first studies are already completed. Using a modular concept, so designed that each module would fit into the cargo bay of the shuttle and would be carried aloft one by one until the station was complete. In stations such as these, men will live, constantly watching our Earth for problems or dangers. Once the mission is completed, the orbiter goes out of orbit, re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, and lands on an existing 10,000-foot runway as an airplane. It is then towed to a maintenance hangar, given an airplane type refurbishing and cleaning, and 14 days later, it is ready to go again. While there are still doubters among us today, fortunately, most people have the capacity for looking further ahead. Many of the shuttle opponents want the money used for space switched to Earth problems. But just what are those Earth problems? Let's take a look at just a few examples of what the space program has provided in those so-called problem areas. And keep in mind that these are not the reasons for which the space program was originally created. Take air pollution as a start. Space photos have shown air pollution over Los Angeles proper, and also pollutants pouring out of the San Gabriel River into the Los Angeles Harbor, as indicated by the white streaks in the ocean below the coastline. But air, water, and ground pollution are never local or even national problems. Global monitoring and warning is the name of the game. And for that, we must get our view from space. The point is, what would take airplanes on a global basis 46 years to monitor in pollution? A shuttle laboratory could monitor in just 18 days. Do you realize that mankind's greatest killer is not heart disease? Nor is it cancer. It is famine. Space could help us lick this horrible problem. Here is an infrared photo. Anything living containing chlorophyll shows up red. You see here the farms of the Imperial Valley of California. From this same photo, the degree of redness can be measured, and we can tell what kind of crops are being grown, whether the crops were young or old, healthy or diseased, and even estimate the yield. Now, if we could know all of this on a global scale, we could estimate what crops the world would produce for the coming season, where and what kind of fertilizing was needed, whether the crops were healthy, and if the production would not be enough to feed a country or the world for that matter 
we could find new or other areas where additional crops could be grown, hence a possible end to famine. From space, we will be able to measure the depth of snow on mountains, estimate how fast it will melt, predict how the water will flow. We can locate perfect sites for dams. We can help solve the energy crisis by finding new clean power sources, some in space. But one such power source is geothermal power, water heated in the earth. This huge potential under the earth is virtually untapped. From space, we can easily locate these great pockets the type of power that causes geysers and volcanoes and speed their development by many years. One of the greatest areas to benefit from space is the field of meteorology. Just thinking back to the most recent hurricane warning should be enough to show us the advantages of better weather forecasting. Think what accurate weather predictions will do for the farmer in crop planting and harvesting, for the construction industry, or even for John Q. Public in planning a picnic. Well, those are all rather large areas of benefits, right? But what has space done for us lately? What we might term see, touch, and feel benefits. Let's look at just a minute percentage of some of the more obvious. For instance, because of that tragic Apollo fire long ago, we now have several new types of cloth, beta and duret, to name just a couple. We now have clothes, blankets, drapes, materials worn by firemen. They all have something in common. They will not burn. How about a gasoline auto tank that will not catch on fire after a crash? A non-flammable paint that literally puts out the fire when it comes close. That's already here in cold latticoat. Or how about a rocket torch with a solid fuel that cuts through three-quarter inch steel at the rate of three feet per minute? If you're a sportsman, you probably would appreciate a new type blanket, the size of a cigarette pack, made of the same mylar used on the Echo satellite and weighing only three and one half ounces. Medical benefits are myriad. They literally number in the thousands. They range from a revolutionary electrocardiograph electrode to an adaptation of a manipulator arm for the paraplegic, which enables the patient to write, put on lipstick, and eat. The future offers projects, accomplishments, and benefits so enormous as to be almost incomprehensible. We will have space cities, space hospitals, space factories, space hotels. We will have a generation of people born and raised in space saying, gee, that Earth is a great place to visit, but I sure wouldn't want to live there. All of these things, as important and far-reaching as they are, are by no means the most important. Even today, a new feeling of common interest, of common hope, of vast new horizons toward which man can set his goals are being developed between nations. Yes, today, even more than when good old Buck Rogers said it 40 years ago, what is hoped for, more than any other benefit, as a direct result of space exploration, is international, everlasting peace.
There has been life on Earth for over two billion years, and man himself has existed here for at least a million. Yet it is no more than 15 years since life has emerged out of our atmosphere into outer space. Historians a million years hence may well regard the middle of this century as the turning point of earthly life and of our own species. America's space program today stands on its own feet, an heroic manifestation of the vital evolutionary progress of man toward a higher and better life. It is justified by its success to date, by its promise of continuing success in the future, and in the enlargement of human knowledge of the universal environment in which our spaceship Earth travels. Its accomplishments to date are marvelous, bordering on the incredible. From a humble, sputtering beginning, man has progressed to today's mighty Saturn V rocket. Many years ago, a figure quite familiar to most of us today came upon the scene. His name, Buck Rogers. The younger generation of four decades ago were engrossed with his escapades in the future. So, that younger generation grew up, and using the example that Buck had shown them, designed and built their way into the future. For instance, he predicted men would fly around with little jets strapped to their backs. Forty years later, we are doing just that. In 1932, Buck predicted atomic energy and its use for producing electrical energy for mankind. Today, we have it. In 1936, Buck and Wilma explored the moon, and in the dim light, they thought they saw something move. Since July 20th, 1969, that movement could have been American astronauts. Five centuries ahead of Buck's prediction. In 1903, man, for the first time, using generated power, flew away from his planet. Orville Wright flew about 20 feet high, and he traveled about 200 feet before returning to Earth. His journey lasted 12 seconds. Today, 70 years later, we have reached the planets. Who is to say how soon before man reaches the stars? Some believe that this is man's destiny, his ultimate purpose. Until that day arrives, he will remain restless, always searching, exploring, expanding against the unknown. For such is his nature. Many say that this should not be, that the money spent on space should be spent right here on Earth. They are quite honestly wrong. But other great people have been wrong too. Daniel Webster once said, it is a waste of taxpayers' money to explore west of the Adirondacks. Later on, we will show you just how wrong the critics of the space program are. But what about today? Where are we in space exploration? What does the immediate future hold? The point of this nostalgic look at Buck Rogers was to show you just how much we have condensed the technology of the future into the past 30 to 40 years. Hopefully, that brief journey into the past will prepare all of us to accept the fact that the next 30 to 40 years will witness far greater projections into future technology and space accomplishments. What has space exploration and the vast wealth invested in it brought to the average man and woman? We shall see. You are all aware of the amazingly successful Apollo program a program that has been called the greatest technological achievement in the history of mankind. Yet there are people, important people, that scoff at Apollo as a waste of good money. Until Apollo, we honestly had little background for space. We had to produce an almost superhuman effort to develop materials and technology that we knew little about. So we entered a period that is best termed the age of space exploration. Not only exploring space, but also the technologies of the space industry itself. With the Apollo lunar landing program completing its task in December 1972, we are at last ready to enter the golden age, the age of space exploitation. If you look up that word in the dictionary, you will find it means to make use of. That's where we stand now, ready to use the knowledge that we have gained in space to even a greater degree than the past decade for the benefit of all mankind. 
The first step is the program called Skylab. We have modified the third stage of the Apollo 5 launch vehicle and transformed it into an orbiting laboratory. A laboratory in which men perform experiments, all aimed at benefiting the Earth and those on it. Three separate man crews staying up as long as 56 days will spend most of their time studying ways to benefit Earth. The next major program will be the Apollo Soyuz test project, ASTP, which will find an Apollo spacecraft docking with a Soviet Soyuz. Crews will be bilingual and actually will spend time in each other's spacecraft. There are many important tasks to be accomplished here, but none as important as bringing together two former antagonists for a venture in peace. After this program, we will be ready for man's first real step toward the stars. It is hard to exaggerate the importance of the space shuttle to man's future in space, and for that matter, perhaps his survival on this planet. For this is the vehicle man will use to jump a thousand years into the future. Scholars someday may look back upon the first flight of the space shuttle as the beginning of true space travel. So what is the space shuttle and what does it mean to our nation and the people of the world? The space shuttle, which will be operational during the 1980s and 90s, is a reusable vehicle. Its orbiter might best be described as a space truck. Really, that's its main purpose, to transport cargo or personnel from Earth to space. With it, we will have ended the building probably forever of huge one-use booster rockets. For with the shuttle, Many projects will be assembled in space. A key feature of this space truck is its enormous cargo bay. Remember that the shuttle is not small. In fact, it is far larger than any spacecraft ever built. The Apollo command module is tiny beside it. The cargo bay is 60 feet long with a 15-foot diameter. This compares in size to the passenger compartment of a 747. It is in this compartment, or cargo bay, that the space truck will carry its large payloads into space. The greatest expenses of the space program have been the launch costs and expendable spacecraft. With a shuttle, however, there will be a tremendous reduction in the cost of America's space program. The rough estimate is that the cost of launching each pound of space cargo will be reduced about 90% from $1,000 to $100 per pound. In order to give you a better understanding of how the shuttle works, let's follow a projected launch and performance of this craft that holds the key to man's venture into space. Actually, the shuttle orbiter is a space airplane which is capable of more than 100 flights to space and back. It will be launched in a vertical position as a rocket. The orbiter has three main engines. Each of these develop 470,000 pounds of thrust. Fuel, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen for the orbiter engines will be carried under the belly of the shuttle orbiter. Strapped to the external tank are two recoverable solid rocket motors which will assist in boosting the shuttle from the launch pad. These solid propellant motors generate four million pounds of thrust each. After liftoff at about 23 miles, the two solid rocket motors will have used all of their propellant and will be jettisoned. Then they will be brought back to a pre-selected landing site by parachute. The shuttle orbiter, meanwhile, continues on its own power to climb to approximately 125 miles, where the giant belly tank is jettisoned. The orbiter then stays in Earth orbit for a nominal period of seven days, performing a multitude of tasks. The primary purpose of the shuttle will be to place satellites in orbit. Using the huge cargo bay, which is capable of handling even the largest projected satellites, we will carry them up to orbital altitude without the use of those expensive boosters. The United States is at least a decade ahead of the rest of the world with the shuttle, and we are already having many serious inquiries from other nations that wish us to launch their satellites for them. Eventually, these launchings could produce a profit bonanza for the United States. 
Most satellites today have a fairly short life expectancy. Think of the huge savings the shuttle will produce. For instead of this vast waste, the shuttle can bring repair crews to them or bring them back to Earth for extensive overhauling. Space-age technology is moving so fast that today's best part may be tomorrow's antique. Shuttle crews can replace outdated parts with modern up-to-date new ones and install new systems, thus prolonging their usefulness to infinity. Many satellites require a synchronous orbit to stay over the same part of the Earth. That means that they must go up to at least 22,300 miles. Using the orbiter cargo bay as a launching platform at several hundred miles up reduces the tremendous propulsion power needed to get them into deep orbit and dramatically reduces the cost. The payloads that can be used with a shuttle are limited only by size, weight, and man's creative imagination. The day is not far away when fully equipped laboratories manned by leading scientists and engineers are placed into orbit. Such research that they conduct could revolutionize medical and manufacturing techniques. Keep in mind that these people, including women, will be able to work in a comfortable shirt sleeve atmosphere. Virtually anyone will be able to go into space. Later versions of the shuttle could be space liners that will travel from Earth to hotels, factories, or even cities in outer space. Another very important aspect of the shuttle is that it can be easily outfitted as a short-duration space station. The orbiter could be equipped to stay in space for 30 days, constantly monitoring the entire surface of the Earth for such programs as air, water, and ground pollution monitoring. Eventually, probably during the next 20 years, we will build a crew space station. The first studies are already complete. Using a modular concept, so designed that each module would fit into the cargo bay of the shuttle and would be carried aloft one by one until the station was complete. In stations such as these, men will live, constantly watching our Earth for problems or dangers. Once the mission is completed, the orbiter goes out of orbit, re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, and lands on an existing 10,000-foot runway as an airplane. It is then towed to a maintenance hangar, given an airplane-type refurbishing and cleaning, and 14 days later, it is ready to go again. While there are still doubters among us today, fortunately, most people have the capacity for looking further ahead. Many of the shuttle opponents want the money used for space switched to Earth problems. But just what are those Earth problems? Let's take a look at just a few examples of what the space program has provided in those so-called problem areas. And keep in mind that these are not the reasons for which the space program was originally created. Take air pollution as a start. Space photos have shown air pollution over Los Angeles proper, and also pollutants pouring out of the San Gabriel River into the Los Angeles Harbor, as indicated by the white streaks in the ocean below the coastline. But air, water, and ground pollution are never local or even national problems. Global monitoring and warning is the name of the game. And for that, we must get our view from space. The point is, what would take airplanes on a global basis 46 years to monitor in pollution, a shuttle laboratory could monitor in just 18 days. Do you realize that mankind's greatest killer is not heart disease, nor is it cancer? It is famine. Space could help us lick this horrible problem. Here's an infrared photo. Anything living containing chlorophyll shows up red. You see here the farms of the Imperial Valley of California. From this same photo, the degree of redness can be measured, and we can tell what kind of crops are being grown, whether the crops were young or old, healthy or diseased, and even estimate the yield. Now, if we could know all of this on a global scale, we could estimate what crops the world would produce for the coming season, where and what kind of fertilizing was needed, whether the crops were healthy, and if the production would not be enough to feed a country or the world for that matter 
we could find new or other areas where additional crops could be grown, hence a possible end to famine. From space, we will be able to measure the depth of snow on mountains, estimate how fast it will melt, predict how the water will flow. We can locate perfect sites for dams. We can help solve the energy crisis by finding new, clean power sources, some in space. But one such power source is geothermal power, water heated in the Earth. This huge potential under the Earth is virtually untapped. From space, we can easily locate these great pockets the type of power that causes geysers and volcanoes and speed their development by many years. One of the greatest areas to benefit from space is the field of meteorology. Just thinking back to the most recent hurricane warning should be enough to show us the advantages of better weather forecasting. Think what accurate weather predictions will do for the farmer in crop planting and harvesting, for the construction industry, or even for John Q. Public in planning a picnic. Well, those are all rather large areas of benefits, right? But what has space done for us lately? What we might term see, touch, and feel benefits. Let's look at just a minute percentage of some of the more obvious. For instance, because of that tragic Apollo fire long ago, we now have several new types of cloth, beta and duret to name just a couple. We now have clothes, blankets, drapes, materials worn by firemen. They all have something in common. They will not burn. How about a gasoline auto tank that will not catch on fire after a crash? A non-flammable paint that literally puts out the fire when it comes close. That's already here in cold latticoat. Or how about a rocket torch with a solid fuel that cuts through three-quarter inch steel at the rate of three feet per minute? If you're a sportsman, you probably would appreciate a new type blanket, the size of a cigarette pack, made of the same mylar used on the Echo satellite and weighing only three and one half ounces. Medical benefits are myriad. They literally number in the thousands. They range from a revolutionary electrocardiograph electrode to an adaptation of a manipulator arm for the paraplegic, which enables the patient to write, put on lipstick, and eat. The future offers projects, accomplishments, and benefits so enormous as to be almost incomprehensible. We will have space cities, space hospitals, space factories, space hotels. We will have a generation of people born and raised in space saying, gee, that Earth is a great place to visit, but I sure wouldn't want to live there. All of these things, as important and far-reaching as they are, are by no means the most important. Even today, a new feeling of common interest, of common hope, of vast new horizons toward which man can set his goals are being developed between nations. Yes, today, even more than when good old Buck Rogers said it 40 years ago, what is hoped for, more than any other benefit, as a direct result of space exploration, is international, everlasting peace. The Finley Holiday Slide Cassette Program that you are about to see and hear is the first of its kind ever made available to the public. And it is a new high in audio-visual entertainment for people of all ages. It's very simple to use. Please follow these instructions. First, place your 40 slides in the projector and move to slide one. Then, each time that you hear the tone, advance the slide. It's as simple as that. So now, sit back and Let's enjoy the show. Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 
As mighty engines blast with fearsome intensity, the shock wave of sound echoes across the wide expanse of the Cape Kennedy launch range. And then Apollo 11, carrying her fragile load of humanity, rises with slow majesty off the pad to leap into the heavens. In the steel and concrete blockhouse of launch complex control, this is a tense moment for the men controlling the launch. They can feel the vibration of blastoff, but concentrate on their instrument panels, watching for any little sign that might signal disaster. This is a record book flight, however, with everything go all the way as Apollo 11 rockets high into the upper reaches of Earth's atmosphere. The long tail of fire pushing the Saturn V toward the moon is burning 15 tons of fuel per second. An artist's conception shows what an observer would see deep in space along the path of Apollo 11's flight. Command module pilot Mike Collins has docked with the lunar module and is pulling away from the burnt out Saturn third stage. A backward glance gave the three astronauts this view of Earth as they sped toward the moon. Part of West Africa can be seen. Three days later, during insertion into lunar orbit, the Apollo 11 spacecraft was close enough to get this close-up of the moon's craters. Shortly after entering the lunar module, Armstrong and Aldrin got this shot of the prime landing site in the center near the Terminator. At the upper left center is Hypatia Rills, renamed US-1 by the astronauts. Sidewinder Rill and Diamondback Rill extend across the center of the southwestern Sea of Tranquility. Back on Earth, millions waited anxiously during the final descent of the lunar module for that historic moment of landing. And then... Houston, uh... Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. All over the world, people clapped and cheered as the voice of Neil Armstrong announced the landing. What an awesome sight it must have been for Armstrong and Aldrin to look out upon this desolate scene. They were the first men to view the rough, crater-pocked lunar surface from only a few feet away. Only a few inches of metal separated them from the barren, airless, freezing wasteland of the moon. Looking through another viewport gives the impression of a bizarre, abstract painting. It is, in reality, the zigzag blackness of shadows cast by the lunar module. Now man was going to set foot upon that dead surface and the honor was to go to Commander Neil A. Armstrong. He left the limb and stood on one of the landing pads. Then came that magic moment that finally realized the true beginning of man's conquest of space. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Man was on the moon. Perhaps someday this first footprint to be set in the moon's powdery surface will be gently scooped up and brought back to Earth for all mankind to see. A man no less honored was Buzz Aldrin, the lunar module pilot, and the second man to set foot on the moon's surface. This is Aldrin as he started down the ladder, paused in his bulky spacesuit on the lowest rung, and then jumped down onto the surface to join his comrade in those first almost playful bounding walks about the area where the limb landed. One of the astronauts' first duties after getting used to moving about in the weak gravity of the moon was to deploy the stars and stripes. A wire stiffener was used to keep it unfurled. Armstrong holds the flagstaff, which he had trouble planting in the lunar soil. Aldrin arranges the flag. This photo of Aldrin saluting the flag may seem a little posed, but there is a lot of sentiment in his gesture. They carried more than just a flag across the trackless wastes of space to plant in the moon's rocky soil. They carried a true symbol of peace. This breathtakingly beautiful portrait of the lunar module with Buzz Aldrin standing before it is an example of the superb photography which Armstrong used to such scientific and historic advantage. Now it was time for the astronauts to get busy with the experiments that had been planned as part of the Apollo 11 mission, one of which was to measure the solar wind composition. 
Here, Aldrin erects the metal screen which captured atomic particles from the sun. The light spots are caused by sun rays reflecting in the camera lens. Aldrin carries two of the instrument experiment packages striding along the lip of a fairly large crater. His feet have made deep impressions in the loose soil around the edge of the crater. Notice how easily Aldrin carries the instrument packages. Despite their bulk, they weigh only a few pounds in the weak gravity of the moon. Aldrin is now at his farthest point from the lunar module and is deploying the experiments. The first one he will set up is the seismic component, which measures moonquakes and other land movements on the moon. Near the lunar module and to the left is part of a large crater, showing how close the landing came to disaster. The land was low on fuel, and had it come down on the edge of the crater, it might have tipped over, stranding the astronauts. On the lunar horizon between Aldrin and the crater is the television camera that Armstrong set up just after setting foot on the surface. The large rectangular black panels on either side of the seismic detector are the solar cells that power the electronic data gathering and transmitting units. This experiment was left on the moon's surface and has already returned information to Earth on hundreds of lunar moonquakes and landslides. The largest crater within walking distance of the lunar module is approximately 80 feet in diameter. Neil Armstrong took his own picture when he snapped this shot. Aldrin's gold visor reflects a clear image of Armstrong, Aldrin's shadow, and the lunar module. The small points of light in the background are the experiments. If you look closely, perhaps you can see the frayed area on the left elbow of Aldrin's suit. It isn't known what caused the damage. The small crater in which Aldrin had been standing can be seen more clearly here as he turns toward the limb. The shallow crater is estimated to be over 500 million years old. We came in peace for all mankind reads the commemorative plaque attached to the descent stage of the lunar module which was left on the moon's surface. It bears the signatures of all three astronauts and that of President Richard M. Nixon. Back inside the lunar module after their historic walk on the moon's surface, the astronauts prepared for their departure. Commander Armstrong did have time, however, to take a few more photos of the moon's surface, showing the shadow of the limb on the dusty brown surface. A close-up view of their footprints, crossing and recrossing each other, leaving an indelible mark on the face of the moon to mark man's first passing visit. And the American flag, standing in frozen splendor as a sign that America was the first to send a man to the lunar surface. And at long last, Commander Armstrong had a chance to get his own likeness captured for posterity. This photo was taken by Aldrin just before their departure. A sign of the five days that had already gone by can be seen in the dark stubble of beard on Armstrong's chin. The lunar module, the moon, and the earth rising over the lunar horizon. The amazing composition seen by command pilot Mike Collins as the astronauts rocketed up from the surface to rejoin him. And here is Collins, from the Eagle's point of view, during the final approach for docking with the Columbia. The command module is about 60 miles above the moon at this point. Note the almost perfect roundness of the large craters at the upper left. The three-day journey back to Earth was mostly a time of rest for the astronauts, but one of them caught this beautiful angle of the Earth's atmosphere from deep space. The spacecraft was in the shadow of the Earth, with a reflection of the sun's rays shining through the upper layers of the atmosphere. Home, almost. Once more in the strong grip of Earth's gravity, the Apollo 11 command module hurtled into the Earth's atmosphere, the blunt end of its heat shield blazing with a tremendous heat of re-entry. Meanwhile, at Mission Control in Houston, the technicians wait to see if the computed re-entry path is being followed. This amazing complex from which the entire Apollo series of flights has been conducted is one of the greatest achievements of American technology. Home, at last. 
the astronauts are back safe on Earth, gently rocking in the Pacific waves southwest of Hawaii. Breathing fresh air once more, the astronauts emerge from the blackened and charred space capsule. They are wearing the special biological isolation garments that were to protect against any possible contamination brought back from the moon. As it turned out, the suits weren't necessary. Even though they were back and safe, it would be a while before the astronauts could go out to receive the congratulations of a deliriously happy America. From the recovery helicopter, they moved into the mobile quarantine trailer that would be their home until they reached the lunar receiving laboratory for a 21-day quarantine. This was part of the contamination precautions. Aboard the USS Hornet recovery carrier, and safely tucked into their quarantine trailer, congratulations are in order for the three astronauts. First to officially greet them is President Nixon. Here, he and Buzz Aldrin exchange A-OK -okay signs while Mike Collins looks on. Inside the trailer, Ed Aldrin takes an inventory of the trailer facilities. Neil Armstrong is just behind him talking on the telephone. The Hornet was speeding toward Hawaii, where the astronauts and their trailer would be put aboard an aircraft and flown to Houston. This simple appearing rock is a piece of the heavens one of the moon rocks collected and brought back to Earth. Carried in carefully sealed vacuum containers, it and others have been undergoing intense investigation by scientists all over the world. And this is the beginning. Three immortal names that will echo down the long halls of history. Commander Neil A. Armstrong. Lunar Module Pilot Edwin E. Aldrin and Command Module Pilot Michael Collins. Three men who dared to brave the unknowns of space and the lunar surface so that man might go on to the stars. Your bi-media program is now complete. Please rewind this tape and you will be ready to enjoy it again at your next showing. miles. The color contrasts are an indication of the divisions between belts and zones in this region. The shadow of the satellite Dione is seen as a dark circle on the face of the planet. A large red cloud feature, 7,456 miles in length, is evident in the south polar latitudes and has been seen continuously by Voyager since August 1980. A computer assembled this two-image mosaic of Saturn's rings taken by Voyager 1 at a range of 5 million miles. It shows approximately 95 individual concentric features in the ring. The extraordinarily complex structure of the rings is easily seen across the entire span of the ring system. The 14th satellite of Saturn, discovered by Voyager 1, is seen at the upper left of your screen, just inside the narrow F ring. This F-ring is less than 93 miles wide. The unique red oval cloud feature located at 55 degrees south latitude is shown in this false color image of Saturn's southern hemisphere. The photograph was taken by the spacecraft at a distance of about five and one-third million miles. The difference in color between the red oval and the surrounding bluish clouds indicates that material within the oval contains a substance that absorbs more blue and violet light than the bluish clouds. Two brown ovals at the right of your screen, some 6,000 miles across, were found at approximately 40 degrees and 60 degrees latitude in Saturn's northern hemisphere. 
The photo was taken from a range of 4,600,000 miles. The polar oval, upper right, has a structure similar to the Saturn red spot located in the southern polar latitudes. Saturn is the second largest planet in our solar system. It has a volume 815 times that of Earth, but a mass only 95.2 times greater. Like its giant neighbor Jupiter, Saturn's extremely rapid rotation has caused the planet to be flattened at its poles. The clouds covering Saturn's satellite Titan are seen in their true colors in this image taken by Voyager at a distance of 2.8 million miles. Titan's southern hemisphere appears as the lighter region with a well-defined boundary between the clouds around the satellite's equator. Titan's surface is believed to be shrouded by aerosols rather than the convected clouds found in the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn. Titan is one of the largest satellites in the solar system. Its size approximates the planet Mercury, and it is the only satellite to have retained a substantial atmosphere. Saturn and its satellites Tethys, outer left, Enceladus, inner left, and Mimas, to the right of the rings, are seen in this mosaic of images taken by Voyager 1 from a distance of 11 million miles. Features larger than 220 miles are visible. The projected width of the rings at the center of the disk is 6,000 miles. Saturn was thought to be the only planet encircled by rings until the discovery of Uranus rings in 1977 and Jupiter's in 1979. The heavily cratered surface of Tethys was photographed from a distance of 750,000 miles by Voyager 1. This face of Tethys looks toward Saturn and shows a large valley about 500 miles long and 40 miles wide. The craters are probably the result of impacts and the valley appears to be a large fracture of unknown origin. The diameter of Tethys is about 600 miles, or slightly less than one-third the size of our moon. A color portrait of Saturn's moon Rhea was reconstructed from three Voyager 1 images. Range from the spacecraft to the moon was about one million miles, giving a resolution of about 20 miles on Rhea's surface. The color has been exaggerated somewhat to bring out subtle color differences between the brighter streaks and darker background. The photo shows many wispy light markings on Rhea's surface, which are neither identical to simple ray crater markings, nor the groove terrain on Ganymede in the Jovian system. Here we see a view of Saturn's clouds extending from 40 degrees to 60 degrees north latitude. Visible is a ribbon-like wave structure in the south with small convective features marking a westward jet in the north. Like the three other gas giants, Jupiter, Neptune, and Uranus, Saturn has no solid surface, but is a huge, multi-layered globe of gas with a small core of iron and rocky material. Saturn's F, or outermost ring, was photographed from the unilluminated face of the rings by Voyager 1 at a range of 470,000 miles. Two narrow, braided, bright rings that trace distinct orbits are evident. Visible also is a broader, very diffuse component about 20 miles in width. Note the knots, which probably are local clumps of ring material, but may be many moons. This enhanced Voyager 1 image was taken when the spacecraft was 2 million miles from the planet. The smallest features seen are 36 miles. Enhancement has brought out contrast of features in the north polar region of Saturn. The chevron type pattern of white features in this upper portion of the image reflects the local cloud motion. Many large impact craters are seen in this view of the satellite Dione taken by Voyager 1 from a distance of 149,000 miles. Bright radiating patterns probably represent debris rays thrown out of impact craters. Other bright areas may be topographic ridges and valleys. Also visible are irregular valleys that represent old fault troughs degraded by impacts. Multiple impact craters are seen on the ancient surface of Rhea in this picture taken by Voyager 1 at a range of 45,000 miles. The craters closely resemble those on Mercury and the Earth's moon. 
Many of the craters have central peaks formed by rebound of the floor during the explosive formation of the crater. These Voyager 1 images of Saturn's 11th moon, a trailing co-orbital satellite, were taken from a range of 110,000 miles and show the south polar region of the body. The pockmarked moon is approximately 83 by 43 miles. Comparison of the two images, taken 13 minutes apart, reveal a narrow shadow moving across its face. This is probably cast by a small narrow ring of Saturn a few thousand kilometers away from the satellite. A large circular feature about 120 miles across with a dark spot in its center is visible in this photograph of the satellite Iapetus. The moon's leading hemisphere is to the left and the trailing hemisphere, four to five times brighter, is to the right. The large circular feature is probably a large impact structure outlined by dark material, possibly thrown out by the impact. Titan's thick haze layer is shown in this Voyager 1 image taken from 270,000 miles away. Voyager images of Saturn's largest moon show Titan completely enveloped by haze that merges with a darker hood or cloud layer over the North Pole. The spacecraft's instruments found that the moon has a substantial atmosphere, far denser than that of Mars and possibly denser than Earth's. Eight hours after its closest approach to Saturn on November 12, 1980, Voyager 1 took this picture of the planet's ring system. Major features of the rings are clearly seen. The photo was taken from an angle of approximately 30 degrees above the ring plane. The unique lighting in this view brings out many hundreds of light and dark ringlets that make up this very thin, phonograph record-like ring system. Many impact craters the result of the collision of cosmic debris, are shown in this Voyager 1 color mosaic of the moon Dione. The largest crater is less than 62 miles in diameter and shows a well-developed central peak. Bright rays represent material ejected from other impact craters. Sinuous valleys, probably formed by faults, break the moon's icy crust. Dione is seen here in transit 234,000 miles above the clouds of Saturn in this Voyager 1 photo. The difference in character between the trailing hemisphere on the moon's left side and its leading hemisphere is quite apparent. The trailing hemisphere contains relatively dark material crisscrossed by wispy light streaks. The leading hemisphere shows a relatively uniform surface with many impact craters. The cause of the difference is a subject of continuing study by the Voyager imaging team. Low-level contrast between features in Saturn's cloud deck is shown in this Voyager 1 composite photograph taken at a distance of 1,087,000 miles. The small black shadow of Dione is seen near the bottom of your screen. Wind speeds in this latitudinal area are as high as 90 miles per hour so distances between features increase rapidly. The surface of the satellite Mimas is shown to be heavily cratered, a record of the bombardment that occurred throughout the solar system in its early history some four billion years ago. This Voyager 1 photo shows craters as small as one mile across. Craters stand shoulder to shoulder on the surface of Saturn's satellite Rhea seen in this Voyager 1 mosaic of the north polar region of that moon. Rhea is 1,490 miles in diameter and is the most heavily cratered of the moons of Saturn. The largest crater, made by the impact of cosmic debris, is about 185 miles in diameter. Multiple ridges and grooves, visible near the shadow edge, resemble those seen on Earth's moon and Mercury. This computer-enhanced image of Saturn shows the rings and their shadows on the lighted crescent of the planet. The bright limb of Saturn is clearly visible through the rings. This image was enhanced to bring out detail in the rings, causing the illuminated crescent of the planet to be overexposed. The inner region of the rings scatters light in a way that causes it to look bluer than the outer ring. Layers of haze covering Titan are seen in this image taken by Voyager 1 at a range of only 13,700 miles. The colors are enhanced 
and are used to show details of the haze that shrouds Titan. The underside of Saturn's rings is shown in this photograph taken by Voyager 1 about 10 hours before its closest approach to the planet. This view of the rings is dramatically different than earlier ones of the ring's sunlit face. For example, the normally dark Cassini division now shows as the brightest feature in the rings. Here is another view of Saturn's ring showing the reversal of brightness of the major features when seen from the unilluminated side. This photo was taken on the day of Voyager 1's closest encounter with the planet from a distance of 444,000 miles. The C ring and material in the Cassini division are bright, while the B ring is dark. Voyager 1 took this high resolution color image of Rhea from a range of 79,500 miles. The area shown is one of the most heavily cratered on the satellite and indicates an ancient surface dating back to the period immediately following the formation of the planets about four and a half billion years ago. The photograph shows surface features about 1.5 miles in diameter, similar to a view of Earth's moon through a telescope. The cratered surface of Mimas is seen in this image taken by Voyager 1 from a range of 264,000 miles. Impact craters made by the infall of cosmic debris are shown. The largest is more than 62 miles in diameter and displays a prominent central peak. The smaller craters are abundant and indicate an ancient age for Mimas' surface. Voyager 1 looked back at Saturn four days after the spacecraft flew past the planet to observe the appearance of Saturn and its rings from this unique perspective. Taken from a distance of 3.3 billion miles, the planet's shadow falls upon the rings and the bright Saturn crescent is seen through all but the densest portion of the rings. This montage of images of the Saturnian system, taken by Voyager 1 during its Saturn encounter in November 1980, shows Dione in the forefront, Saturn rising behind, Tethys and Mimas fading in the distance to the right of your screen, Enceladus and Rhea off Saturn's rings to the left, and Titan in its distant orbit at the top. Voyager 1 is on a trajectory taking the uh, slideshow is almost over about, about uh, six more slides to go and uh, then I will have to go on to editing the audio together with the uh, restored slides and then this video should be up somewhere around next week uh, Sunday bringing to all mankind a knowledge of space frontiers undreamed of by those scientists of old who first put their eyes to a telescopic lens. Your Buy Media program is now complete. Please rewind this tape and you will be ready to enjoy it again at your next showing.
All right. Just uh, rewinding the cassette. Oh. Just uh, rewinding the cassette. Oh. You can probably hear the scanner in the background. on earth for over two billion years and man himself has existed here for at least a million yet it is no more than 15 years since life has emerged out of our atmosphere into outer space historians a million years hence may well regard the middle of this century as the turning point of earthly life and of our own species america's space program today stands on its own feet an heroic manifestation of the vital evolutionary progress of man toward a higher and better life. It is justified by its success to date, by its promise of continuing success in the future, and in the enlargement of human knowledge of the universal environment in which our spaceship Earth travels. Its accomplishments to date are marvelous, bordering on the incredible. From a humble, sputtering beginning Man has progressed to today's mighty so these are the last uh, five slides. The collection has uh, 40 slides in total. Actually, all Finley holiday cassettes are four slides, 40 slides in total, 40 slides in total. And um, what's also coming coming up in the mail today is a uh, VHS tape with uh, video footage about uh, space probes, I guess, also from Finley Holiday from about the 80s, so I would guess it is about the early uh, Mars landings uh, and stuff, you know, the Voyager probes and in 1935, uh, that kind of stuff. So that's moon. that's going to be really cool light, to, uh, you know, digitize because I got a uh, VHS player that movement could have been and astronaut. then that's going to be on YouTube Five as well. In 1903, man for the first time, using generated power, flew away from his planet. Orville Wright flew about 20 feet high and he traveled about 200 feet before returning to Earth. Just setting the focus point right here on the area with the most contrast because that's where it has the easiest uh, job focusing. And I'm watching my histogram right here to make sure that um, the colors are fairly well aligned. The histogram is usually a uh, pretty good way to judge whether uh, the colors are neutral on uh, what they were supposed to be when the slides didn't have any color cost. But other great people have been wrong too. Daniel Webster once said, it is a waste of taxpayers' money to explore west of the Adirondacks. Later on, we will show you just how wrong the critics of the space program are. All right. But what about Just today? checking everything Where again to make sure. And uh, yeah, this is looking uh, very good. Nostalgic look at Buck Rogers was to show you just how much we have condensed the technology of the future. And into then the we scan these years. five slides. Hopefully, that brief journey into the past will prepare all of us to accept the fact that the next 30 to 40 years will witness far greater projections into future technology and space accomplishments. What has space exploration and the vast wealth invested in it brought to the average man and woman? We shall see. You are all aware of the amazingly successful Apollo program, a program that has been called the greatest technological achievement in the history of mankind. 
when it when it's scanning you can actually see the raw scan including all the dust that's on it right here all these bl black spots is dust but this will be cleared out uh, so this light will be perfectly clean when um, it's get put in the video not only exploring space because this scanner has digital eyes uh, and that's what it uses to clear up any uh, dust that may be in the photo so I can show you once it saves this one that uh, there will virtually be no dust of course um, when these copies were made there was dust throughout their workflow so it can't clean up dust that uh, is part of the image on the slide that is inherent inherited every time it it gets copied of course uh, but any dust on the physical slide i have right here that's that can be cleaned up no problem I really like these uh, illustrations they just scream 70s to early 80s you know I think and actually will spend time in each other's spacecraft awesome awesome there are awesome. many important tasks to be accomplished here so i'm really None liking how this is turning out former antagonists for a venture i don't know what you guys think after this program we will be ready for man's first real step toward the stars it is hard to exaggerate the importance of the space shuttle to man's future in space and for that matter perhaps his survival on this planet for this is the vehicle man will use to jump a thousand years into the future. Scholars someday may look back upon the first flight of the space shuttle as the beginning of true space travel. I wonder if this is so a photo from uh, Skylab what does it mean to or um, the people of the world. The space shuttle which will be operational during See guys the earth is round is see you can see the uh, curvature so clearly So uh, really that's it's it's that uh, flat to earth first cargo or personnel from earth to space With it we will have ended the building probably forever of huge one use booster rockets For with the shuttle many projects will be assembled in space I have never ever heard a of uh, this, this cartoon before, but apparently is it Remember was uh, pretty small. popular in, in the 40s and 50s or something. It was uh, really futuristic. The cargo bay is you know, uh, think steampunk, space age, you know, that kind of stuff. The diesel punk, uh, space age. I really dig, dig this style though, with those submarine-like um, spaceships. Awesome. You can see a fingernail right here. I don't know why I didn't clean that up. Maybe because it's part of the image. Um, Let's follow a projected launch and performance of this craft that holds the it's but if it isn't, it should have cleaned it up. But whatever. Actually, the this slide was heavily overexposed. No, this is this is from the um, it will be in a seventies because this is Apollo sixteen, I think. But. Um, this comic names. right here Each of these developed it looks to be from the 50s to 60s Fuel I think just the aesthetic under the belly of the shuttle orbiter. yes to the external tank are two I've never heard about that but apparently it, it was uh, pretty popular with uh, kids you know on space enthusiasts it's talked about briefly in the uh, yeah, I don't know where to uh, 
cartoon is from. Let, let's go see. Big Rogers is a fictional space opera uh, that takes place in 2418 Anno Domini, so like 400 years into future. And um, it began in 1929, and it also had radi radio adaptations in the 30s and 40s. So it was actually really far ahead of, it of its time, you know, because it came out in 18 in 1928. So it was like at least 30 or 40 years ahead of its time when you look at other space. Um, related uh, um, cartoons, so that's pretty neat. Most satellites today have a fairly short life expectancy. Think of the huge savings the shuttle will produce. For instead of this vast waste, the shuttle can bring repair crews to them, or bring them back to Earth for extensive overhauling. Space age technology right here. is Let moving me so up. fast that today's best part maybe tomorrow's antique. Shuttle crews can replace outdated parts with modern up-to-date new ones and install new systems, thus prolonging their usefulness. You gotta remember that this was at the beginning of the television because the television really just started in the late 30s and um, it was really really held back by the war and didn't, you know, um, Start up again in the uh, late 40s, 50s. So somebody to be so imaginative that that they you know make up these gin ginormous displays is actually uh, pretty innovative. Such research that they conduct could revolutionize medical and manufacturing techniques. Keep in mind that these people, including women, will be able to work in a comfortable shirt sleeve atmosphere. Virtually anyone will be able to go into space. Oh yeah, this is the last slide. Could be space liners that will travel from Earth Our mission hotels, will be accomplished. World space. peace across yeah. worlds, across nations. Which, you know, <coughs> didn't really happen. I mean, the entire tape of this just screams um, a very opportunistic, how do you call it? A very optimistic view of the future. Unfortunately, uh, almost nothing they talk about on the cassette happened, you know, the space shuttle was kind of a failure, didn't do even half of what um, it was advertised to be able to, so uh, yeah, it's a real shame, but maybe in, so, maybe in some alternate universe we would have gotten a future uh, like this, you know, with multiple space shuttles and space stations and world peace and humans on Mars by the 90s. Yeah, there's still time, I guess. We'll see. While there are still doubters among us today, fortunately, most people have the capacity. We're just, you know. 50 years later than expected, but, um, but just what are those Earth problems? Let's take a look at just a few examples of what the space program has provided in those so-called problem areas. And keep in mind that these are not the reasons for which the space program Of course, yeah, with the uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin and um, to a lesser degree Galactic Origin, those things are finally coming off of the ground, so I guess 50 years later some of the things talked about on the cassette are finally coming true, you know, commercial-ish space travel for non-astronauts, maybe in 10 more years, 5 more years, who knows. And for that, we must get our view from space. The point is, 
What would take airplanes on a global basis 46 years to monitor in pollution? A shuttle lab no, no, or no orbital hotels. <laughs> that's, I think that's going to be taking a bit longer. The closest thing we have is the uh, ISS, and that took like trillions of dollars to make on the combined effort by the entire human race. So I can't ever imagine a private entity, you know, having anything even close to the ISS in orbit for a long period of time. Of time. And we can tell what kind of crops are being grown, whether the crops were young or old, healthy or diseased, and even estimate the yield. Now, if we could know but, uh, on a global scale, we'll see, I guess, it are exciting times. I just hope it doesn't stagnate again, you know, like what happened after Apollo. Um, but, uh, we could find new or other areas where additional crops could be grown, hence a possible end to famine. Like, well, like America will land on From the moon maybe a few more times, and we'll have like a private space station, and we'll have some commercial launches, you know, by Galactic, by Virgin Galactic, and that will be it for the next... 50 years, you know, and when we're all old, or some people may be dead that are watching, I don't know, maybe I will be 80, and then finally we'll take the next step. From space, we can easily locate these great pockets, the type of power that causes geysers and volcanoes, and speed their development by many years. One of the greatest areas to benefit from space I, uh, I'm not too optimistic, given the record of uh, advancements stagnating after like several times they have been accomplished. But yeah, like, the most sad part is of course uh, how Tico Zed talks about world peace and everybody living in harmony on the space race springing is all together that uh, didn't really happen so it's kind of sad it's a pretty sad commentary anyways i have been rambling on long enough i will be uh, closing the stream and thanks everybody for watching they will not burn